Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to welcome a very special guest for today's episode. Her name is Labone Moses. Hi, Labone. It is Hi. so nice to have you here. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Wonderful. So let's just get right into it. Uh, why don't you briefly start by telling the audience about who you are and what you do? Great. Uh, well, my name is Labone Moses. I am CEO of Chisara Ventures, which is a management consulting practice um, focused in two areas, primarily uh, risk management, compliance, and cybersecurity is one area and um, organizational uh, strategy for my clients is the other area. I am a first generation American, uh, born of Guyanese immigrant parents. I have Caribbean roots. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Born in Brooklyn, New York. So you are the CEO of your own company. That's huge. So what would you, what would you say um, was the defining moment for you that led you to your profession and to eventually start your own business? Sure. Wow, the defining moment. So, um, you know, one thing for me, um, I realized very early in life, actually, that entrepreneurship um, was a way to build wealth. I come from a very entrepreneurial family. Mm -hmm. So that's always been in the back of my head. Um, both my parents started businesses. My dad started his own law firm. Um, and I watched him do that. My mom started a nonprofit. I watched her do that. Um, and so, you know, early forming is very important. So that stuff was always in the back of my head. Right. Um, when I was, um, in college, I went to business school and um, I started out as an international business major at Bentley University. And my sophomore year, um, I was really engaged in an organization called the National Association of Black Accountants. Mm -hmm. They were mentoring me, they were providing scholarship dollars, they were providing career coaching. Nice. And they had this annual event called the Bentley Business Bowl, where they partnered with my school and uh, students at the school. We analyzed real life business cases, came up with solutions and presented them to a panel of judges who were from local corporations. Oh, wow. Well, in Boston. Mm -hmm. Well, um, my sophomore year presentation, my team came in third. And one nice. of my judges, thank you. One of my <laughs> judges was, um, an executive at at the what was at the time the number one public accounting firm in the world, Pricewaterhouse Coopers. Oh yes. And she she approached me, and um, she said, you know, um, I really think you'd do well with an accounting internship. And I thought, mm -hmm. no, I, I don't think so. I don't like my accounting classes. I'm doing well. <laughs> I was, I was, right. I was. I had straight A's, but I didn't like it. Yeah. Um, it wasn't exciting. And um, she said, no, no, no. The accounting is so much more than numbers, you know. And um, so I, I ended up um, taking advantage of a, a summer program that this um, company had. And I worked uh, within that program. I, I, I worked through their projects, but also did a lot of networking. And I was able to see that this industry called accounting was definitely a lot bigger than numbers. Right. Um, I ended up working full time for that same company. And uh, my interesting um, from not liking accounting to working for that company, doing accounting. Right, right, right. <laughs> That's an interesting yes, story. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But my career, the, the role that I went into in the company was actually a mix of um accounting and information systems, information which was an exact match to my major. I had shifted my major coming off of that sophomore summer from international business to accounting and information systems, which was sort of a dual major that mm -hmm. then offered at the time. Right. And um, so that's the area my internship was in. I was walking into companies 
And instead of auditing their numbers, I was auditing the systems that create the numbers. Right. I had, I was on teams where we had 20, we had 48 to 72 hours to go into a company, learn their processes, learn their systems, learn about their people and understand uh, their business transactions from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. Um, That taught me how to assess companies. Right. Actually led me to my consulting career because as a consultant, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. We assess companies, we identify areas of strength, areas of weakness, and come up with solutions to solve their problems. We're just professional problem solvers, right? Right. And um, that training set me up for that. That's very interesting. That's a very interesting point to make. And just for, you know, for the benefit of the audience, I, I want to see what we can take away from changing your major because you were influenced by someone who saw a potential in you and, and advised you to look, look elsewhere. Yeah, I think that there's two ways to learn in life, <laughs> right? From right. your own mistakes and from the mistakes of others, right? right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mistakes is a harsh way to lean towards that lesson. But the reality is that that's why mentorship and coaching is so important. And um, that is why organizations like uh, National Association of Black Accountants was pivotal in this process for me because I was leaning on them for the mentorship and coaching as an international business major. Right. But in being coachable, because I was coachable, I was willing to listen to what someone with more experience Mm -hmm. than me had to say. And suddenly, my world went from this. It opened up. Right. So I thought accounting was just the numbers we calculated in class, Mm -hmm. which is why I didn't like it, because it wasn't exciting enough. Right. Right. Um, I needed someone with more experience than me to help me do this. To and direct you into an area that you could explore and see for yourself, because you said earlier that you thought it was just a numbers numbers game and then you realize it was more than numbers. When you say more than numbers, explain what you mean by that. Well, because the numbers are the final output. Right. That's it. So so a cake is a cake. Mm -hmm. It really, you know, it it looks good, it tastes good, but you're having the final output. Mm -hmm. You didn't see the mixing. You didn't watch the ingredients go in. And if I handed you the cake and you've never had it before and I told you to make it, mm-hmm. you probably wouldn't know how to make it, right? But there's a process that goes on before it. And so when you think about the accounting and even finance arena, the numbers that everyone knows those industries for are the final output. Mm-hmm. But what it takes to create those numbers, what it takes to manage those numbers, what it takes to predict how those numbers will move, what it takes to secure the company because of those numbers Mm -hmm. is a whole nother ball game. And so that's what I mean when I say accounting is so much more than numbers. numbers. Because I I remember I was so blown away when I learned that the team I was on would actually audit the company before the financial audit before the numbers were calculated. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if we could tell you that the process that creates the numbers is wrong, guess what we know about the numbers? They're They're probably wrong. Wrong. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So that, right? So there's so much more. And in the, in the end, here's the crux of it. Numbers tell a story. A story, absolutely. And so if you can learn how to read the story, you can be successful in any type of business. That is true. So you and that's what I do. I, I learned to read the story. Mm-hmm. So you said you went into companies and within a short space of time you had to do auditing and um, I'm sure over time you amass um, experience working not only for this company, because I know you, you worked for 
um, some of the leading accounting firms. You also work for some of the leading global financial companies. So I would imagine you've acquired um, a lot of experience during that time. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I have um, just over 20 years of experience assessing companies and advising business leaders. Mm -hmm. um, I have my in my client base, hundreds, over 100 and something companies right. um, from Fortune 500 alone wow. um, that I have worked with. And so uh, the majority of my career has been focused on large scale Fortune 500 companies. And I now in my private business do a lot of work with smaller and medium sized companies. Mm -hmm. As the reality is, I learned uh, those companies need the same servicing, but that servicing has even greater impact because they have fewer resources. Right. Right. So, yeah. um, so when you, so now you, you, I mean, you have obviously 20 years is an impressive set of um, experience to have from um, some of the largest accounting and financial institutions. And now you decided that, you know, I can actually go on my own and advise these companies. How, how did you make that leap? How did that happen for you? Yeah, you know, um, I planned it out. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm a risk taker, but the reason I'm a risk taker is because I can measure risk. And I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. And so I actually started my company. I came up with the idea for my company in 2012. I was on partner track at a public accounting firm and I had uh, lots of clients um, and I was providing them with lots with this great servicing that the company offered. Uh, but I also had a network of small businesses and startups that needed servicing. Mm -hmm. And the more I understood about what they needed, the more I realized that I could provide this to them because I'm giving this to, I'm providing this currently to large scale companies. Um, on the startup end, I had been an angel investor. I had just begun angel investing in um, 2012. And I realized that startups needed far more than money. They needed strategic advice. Mm -hmm. Again, the same type of strategic advice that I was you're giving to these companies, these large companies. And so that started me on a path and I began to build my business and clientele while working in my corporate career. So I paralleled it. I worked my business on the side, uh, weekends, time off, and I focused on my career during the week. And um, until I got to a point where I felt my business could stand on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was 2018. 2018. So it, it looks like you have and you're doing well for yourself. But I, I imagine, you know, you, you are very successful, obviously, your track record says that. Um, but I imagine it was, it was not always easy. Uh, so let's talk about some of the challenges you encounter. So people who are interested in doing similar things like you do, can learn from the challenges and how you were able to to deal with them so you can push forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, challenges are everywhere. <laughs> so the, first thing, the first thing that I think is really critical is the ability to embrace failure. Um, I, like I said, I'm a risk taker. Mm -hmm. And as a risk taker, that means I fail a lot, right? Um, I take calculated risks. Um, and the reason that they need to be calculated is because I just might, I just might fail, right? <laughs> um, so by no means was my career perfect. Um, I, you know, when I started my business, um, I felt like 
I had to convince some people that I was even worth mm-hmm. their um, trust. And obviously trust is something that's earned, but it was interesting because I realized that I was in this world where my credentials, my resume, my client experience alone didn't stand mm-hmm. on its own. Right. Um, especially not as a black woman. Um, it stood on its own within a large firm, but that's because I had the firm's name tied mm-hmm. to me when I walked into the boardroom. Having walking into the boardroom by myself without the name of the large scale multi-million dollar firm, well, now they're looking at a young black woman right, and saying, why you and who do you think you are? Um, and that question of who does she think she is? Who do you think you are? Is probably the biggest question I've gotten across my career. Mm-hmm. Um, how, did you, how did you handle that? What did you, how did you navigate? So I do something that I've termed as leading offensively. Leading offensively. Tell us yeah. about that. I, I, I lead from the offense. I decide what the plan is and I move forward with the plan. Mm-hmm. And by leading offensively, leading from the offense, I don't respond to you. I do what I came to do. Mm-hmm. So if I've come to present Uh, a proposal to your company and you're sitting back questioning who I think I am, what I will do is present my proposal Mm -hmm. to your company so you can see what I plan to bring. Exactly. (laughs) What I would not do is respond Mm -hmm. to your question Mm -hmm. of who I am because now I'm moving from the defense. Mm -hmm. I move from the offense. It's helped me tremendously. It's helped me with confidence because a lot of times those questions are asked to throw your confidence off. Mm -hmm. But when you decide in your mind that you are not going to react, then it helps you preserve your energy to focus on what's most important. And that dramatically helps with confidence so definitely staying focused was definitely staying on the mission you're here for a purpose oh, and right. no matter what the distraction is you you maintain i'm here to deliver this package mm-hmm. and that's how i'm going to do that's what i'm going yeah. to do you are the ceo of your own venture company your business um, consulting practice your strategist your investor you talked earlier about being an angel investor you are entrepreneur and i am wondering about well um financial wellness Mm -hmm. and how you got involved in that line of work talk about your Mm -hmm. you being an angel investor and then talk about um how you are so passionate about creating wealth and spreading wealth by investing in and advising black owned women owned startups let's talk about that um, so angel investing is very important to me. I, I didn't know it existed until um, I became one. It's not something that at the time in 2012 wasn't something that I don't think was broadly spoken of. Mm-hmm. It's talked about a lot more now. Um, but I realized two things. One, like I said, these startups needed a lot more than money. They mm-hmm. needed advice. You could give them 10000 the 10,000 would be gone in a month if they didn't know what to do with it. Right. So they needed advice. But what I also realized was the gap in funding and support and access to resources for black owned um, and women owned companies was tremendous. And I began to see it firsthand. I sat in rooms uh, watching companies pitch their business, and I saw the difference, the stark difference between how white 
founders were treated and Black founders were treated, mm-hmm. especially Black women. Right. I saw how little they were being taken seriously. Um, and that gave me even more passion around the need to not just be an angel, but to encourage others who have the ability and have um, you know, reached a certain point to be able to be accredited to begin angel investing because more money will come to founders who look like me mm-hmm. and there are more investors who look like me. Um, that's a reality that uh, I have seen play out over and over again. Um, I'm extremely passionate uh, within that about closing these gaps. Mm-hmm. The, um, I think it, and there's an organization in Boston. I want to say it was, um, uh, I don't, I, I can't remember the name of the organization, but it was an organization in Boston that did a wealth study where they identified that the average net worth of a black family in Massachusetts was $8. And the average net worth of a white family was over a hundred thousand. Oh my goodness. What a huge gap. Dollars over a hundred thousand. Well, how do we build wealth? Mm -hmm. Let's think about that. Ownership, ownership of businesses, ownership of real estate, generational wealth, managing wealth. That's how you close that gap. And so I'm very passionate about that. I, um, I made it a point to focus my investment, my personal investment thesis on black founders and women. Um, I also founded a wealth institute um, in uh, North Carolina where I live uh, that is a uh, one year financial wellness program, not just literacy. Phase one, it's three phases. Phase one is literacy where I've recruited professionals from the community to come out and teach courses. Uh, Mm. Two is um, application where uh, professionals come in and sit on panels. We've had no less than 50 years of experience on any panel. Closer to 100 years of experience. Mm -hmm. And students can ask them all the questions they want about how to, to do certain financial things. And then phase three is coaching, where we give each student in the Wealth Institute their own personal coach. Mm -hmm. um, And we allow them to work towards a single financial goal. Um, But I started that because of my deep passion to close this wealth gap. I can't boil the ocean, none of us can, but Mm -hmm. we can boil that little pot on the stove. Right. we all have a kettle or a pot on the stove we can boil. And that's all I'm trying to do is within my world, within my span of influence, within my scope, is to boil that pot. Mm-hmm. What, what kind of pitfalls do you most commonly see in clients you work with? Yeah, I think some of the biggest challenges is how we manage money um, and having the right access, access. to information regarding how to get money, access to the sources who have money. Those are some of the biggest challenges. And I don't, I wouldn't even say that these businesses are making mistakes. Mm -hmm. Many times they simply don't know. They didn't know that's how they should have managed that loan. They didn't know this is where they should have gone to get the loan. You know, when the pandemic um, happened, a, a lot, of money was on the table for being available for businesses but if, but from what i understood uh, the black and brown folks their access to that funding was not as easily available as it was yes. to others and so two th- two things were happening number one banks yes there were a number of banks and financial institutions that made it more difficult 
for businesses that were owned by people of color to get the loans. The application process itself didn't change. It was getting to the application process. Mm -hmm. So again, it's an issue of access and access to information because had I told you, let's say you're a business owner who was blocked by your bank. Had I told you that you didn't have to go through that bank. All you have to do is click this link and apply here. Mm -hmm. get directly to the application, you would have skipped the harassment process that Mm -hmm. made it more difficult for you to apply. Here's the other challenge. Many businesses weren't ready. So in order to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program, for the SBA disaster loan, you had to have a legally recorded business. Many Black and brown business owners are still operating as sole proprietors. Mm -hmm. They're not filing correctly on their taxes that they have a business, even if they are a sole proprietor. They should still be filing to show the income coming in from that business and they hadn't been. So now, if the paycheck loan is based on the pay you made and you can't show through your taxes Mm -hmm. that you've been making pay, You've been, you've been making payroll, well, how can you get a loan? So that was another challenge. Again, many businesses didn't know the criticality of formalizing their business structure. Mm-hmm. If they knew that not formalizing their business structure could lead them to losing out on large loan funds, mm-hmm. they probably would have formalized their business structure. So what, what, what are some of the things that people can do here in um, some of the challenges that people experience going forward? What are some of the things that people should be doing right now to establish better financial health and create the kind of generational wealth you're talking about? Um, so I think for individuals, uh, number one, create a budget. Create a budget. It is so important It's like your annual physical. You need to know how this system is working currently, right? The goal of the budget is to show you how the money is currently being spent so you can plan how to spend it better. Mm -hmm. That's number one. It's really not about how much you make, it's about how much you keep. So if you can understand how the money is coming in and going out, then at least you can start to select what you need versus what you want versus what can fall off Mm -hmm. your expenditure list, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is retirement accounts. Unfortunately, in our community, many of us don't have retirement accounts. Is it because we We don't don't have IRAs? We don't have 401ks. Is it it a case where we are not... We don't have access or we don't have the information. And what can people do? That's usually a case of information. People just don't know that you can start one. Business owners can start their own IRA. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't work for a corporation, you can open up a SEP IRA, right? So we don't know this, but I would encourage people to go to your local financial institution where you currently bank and ask them about setting up a retirement account. The retirement accounts come in many forms. And so you can set up various types. So I don't want to tell you what to tell them to set up. Mm-hmm. Ask them for an appointment, sit down with the representative and say, I would like to set up a retirement account. How does that work through your institution? It's, it's at least a start. You can always move your account to another institution if you don't like them, but it's a start. Access to the information is killing us. Not having access to the information is killing us, right? Right. The third thing I would say is get life insurance. Um, Life insurance? Yes. I wasn't thinking that. Life insurance. Interesting. Very, very important. I can tell you that the majority of wealth sitting in the hands of the living right now was passed 
at least a portion of it was passed down from another generation. That's yeah. There is a massive wealth transfer that's already started over the past 10 years, and it's going to continue because the boomer generation is moving on. Those boomers who had built wealth and those who maybe didn't but had insurance policies are passing that wealth on down to their families. Here's the key. We often think about us. So, oh, well, what's insurance policy going to do for me when I die, I die. Right. But if I have it's not children, for you. I can right. make my child. I can make my child a millionaire with my, my death alone can right. turn my child into a millionaire. Mm -hmm. And now the struggle that I have to face to find money, to buy this, to, to sponsor this, to fund this, they won't have. A friend of mine in college, um, she uh, uh, told me that in her family tradition, they live for seven years beyond, seven generations beyond them. So when a child is born, I learned this in business school in college. She said, when a child is born in her family, um, the child is immediately given an insurance policy. An insurance policy is automatically taken out on that child by the grandparents. Hmm. So every child has an insurance policy. Now, you know that the younger you are when you take out the policy, the less money the policy is every month. You're right. So now every child has a low cost insurance policy. As they grow older, the money is still there, but the cost is very low. And, if, and, and anytime someone in the family moves on, their money from the insurance policy is dispersed to the other family members. Mm -hmm. So wealth continues for seven generations in her family. To accumulate, yes. And so, so for, for the black and brown folks who may just be getting started or would like to get involved and, and to start creating their own generational wealth, what, what, what are we not doing that we need to start doing? I know you talk about earlier about creating a yeah. budget and, and getting an insurance mm -hmm. policy and, 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 and getting retirement a, account. a retirement mm -hmm. account, but for a lot of us, we are still, some of us are still not there yet. And the quicker we start, the better it will be, not only for us, but for the children and the children that will come behind us. What, what are we mm -hmm. missing? What, what, what lessons, where do we need to go? Where do, what information did we, do we need to know so that we can inform ourselves to make some of those decisions that we obviously we are running behind on. Well, here's the thing. You don't have to be an expert in everything. That's why the banks ex exist. Mm -hmm. That's why financial professionals are in their profession. You just have to trust someone other than yourself. And I know trust is a big issue. It's a big thing, yes, for us. <laughs> for us, it's major, but that really is the roadblock. Mm -hmm. Because if, if we can trust someone other than ourselves, then we can go sit down in that Bank of America office, mm -hmm. in that um, Chase office, or in that community bank office, or that credit union office. I don't know where you bank, but you can go sit down and say, I'd like to speak with someone about opening a retirement account. What are my options? Mm -hmm. You can sit down with someone and say, here's my budget. What do I do next? The idea that you can figure it out yourself is not realistic. You can, right. you can, but it's not realistic, right? Mm -hmm. And so with all the financial professionals, many of whom look like me, right? So it's not like you don't have options that are um, people that look like you and talk like you, with all of those options, you just have to trust someone to help you get there. That's why I started the Wealth Institute because the reality is all we have to do is guide people in mm -hmm. many, many times that's all they need is a guide. And once they have that guide, they've taken off. Some of our, our um, participants have purchased homes They've jumped their credit score 300 points. Mm -hmm. 
opened up retirement accounts. They've started businesses. They just needed a guide. And so that's what we, I think trust is got to get ourselves over that hump of trust. Right. So I had, um, I spoke to someone who's a business owner recently, and although her business is thriving and she's doing extremely well, some of the issues she constantly had, although uh, she felt like her money was passing through the banks because she was doing so well, when it came time to probably get a loan or to get um, capital to come into the company, she came across some difficulty with these organization, although she already had an established relationship with that. So a lot of times it's not, maybe people do not, it's, it's kind of more difficult for black and brown folks to go through some of these processes and go into it with trust because of some experiences they may have. So not knowing is a bad thing, but also getting information and putting yourself in front of the right people, for example, people like you that are doing all of these different things to help um, the black and brown folks, you know, to, to create the kind of wealth that we need, not only for ourselves, but from, for generations to come. The trust is something that we definitely need to get over if we're going to get ahead and move forward. Yes. It's and you, like, have to find, you have to find the right people to trust. Right. I've had some very bad experiences. Um, you know, I, when I moved to North Carolina, um, I had a situation where the bank, when they heard me over the phone, they approved me for um, a 4.1 interest rate with, um, uh, I think it was 10% down. Mm-hmm. And then when I filled out the paperwork and I put African-American, the underwriter mm-hmm. called me and said, um, they had to change their requirement and now they need 30% down and they wanted to raise the interest rate. And that was because... And um, they said, you know, oh, we overlooked some things. And after going through your file and underwriting, well, the only new piece of paper in the file was the demographic paper, which Mm -hmm. said that I'm out. Oh, my goodness. That's exactly the issue I'm talking about. Every other thing was filled out except that. And once I sent that in, I got a call from the underwriter. Mm -hmm. So now I had a pre-approval letter from this bank, this financial institution saying 4.1%, 10% down. And I had them telling, even though you have that pre-approval letter, we're not going to, we're not going to fund, we're not going to finance the house without 30% down, even if we leave the interest rate where it is. Wow. Well, I found a brand new home um, in a community that was being built. I um, ended up Uh, being able to purchase um, and see the home, the finishing of the home um, for myself. And it happened that the builder had a mortgage company Mm. and the builder had their mortgage company match the pre-approval letter that I had. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. And approved me, ran my credit. I mean, my credit was 750. Right. So running my credit wasn't a big deal. Ran my credit, matched the approval letter 4.1% and gave me 3% down. So you had a roadblock and you did not let that deter you. You moved on and you found somebody know. else that you could trust. So so, right. and, so when and one so, so the, the message here is if if one turns you down, you don't give up, you move on and you find somebody else who is willing to take on your situation and work with you. So I guess the message, what is the message is don't give up, keep moving. You keep moving and, and you don't let that experience define Mm -hmm. your level of trust because I don't trust that institution where the underwriter changed his mind when he saw my race, but that doesn't, mean that I don't trust another institution. Right. I had to put my trust in the mortgage company of the builder. And I did. And they came through. And it worked out. Right. So don't give up. Um, keep pushing forward. You know, we might find roadblocks along the way. And that's life. You know, nothing is going to happen 
perfectly how we want it. And you know, the your company that you created to help brown and black folks to build and, and create the kind of wealth that we need for our future and, and the future generations that are coming behind us. I, I know that you are doing something well for the community. You also do a lot of community work. And um, one of the things I, in, in, in doing my research about you, I found out that you actually um, created a scholarship fund um, at Bentley University. Can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so I um, uh, co-created. Uh, I will give credit to my trustee partner. I'm a trustee of, of Bentley University. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one of my fellow trustees, Rob Allen, it was actually his um, idea to, uh, to form this um, scholarship fund. I was a founding um, uh, member with him. So it was our funds that came together. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reason for it is we had an amazing administrator at the university, Dr. Earl Avery, who um, helped so many, so many black and brown students and other students of all races, color, right. um, colors and creeds to succeed at Bentley and overcome obstacles and hurdles. Um, but he really, he really, when it came to students of color, um, he really put himself on the line for us and it made the difference in our lives, in our careers. Um, it truly made the difference. And so when Rob came to me with this idea, I thought this is absolutely something that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I joined in with him and we created the scholarship fund, um, the Dr. Earl Avery Scholarship Fund at Bentley. And which, which kind of what? Which is focused on academic scholarships for students of color. Oh yeah, that's that was my my next question. Well, I've always admired you and supported you because I know how passionate you are about empowering people, and and the time you give um, to your community to create change. And I, I I really want to commend you on all the work that you're doing, but um. I, I want to go back and ask you a question about um, at this point in your career, what do you think um, has been a, a highlight and a low light for you? The impact that I've been able to have with uh, startup companies and with uh, founders um, has just been tremendous. Mm -hmm. Um, not just financially, but being able to give them the advice that takes their business to the next level and seeing the results and having them come back to me and say, I mean, that, that to me is the result of 20 years of experience right. mm -hmm. used really good reasons. Um, so that, that is a highlight, you know, this past year in the pandemic, um, the first year of the pandemic, 2020, I did a significant amount of work for those companies for free mm -hmm. just to wow. help them get their footing, uh, find funding, uh, get back on their feet, use the money correctly. Um, and when I look back at that, I can honestly say that's a proud moment for me mm -hmm. because it's not just about us. My mom would always say, if one of us is not okay, none of us is okay. That's right. Right. That's how we need to think. And because we don't always think that way, you see um, great disparities in our world. So um, I'm really proud of that. Um, a low moment, wow. Um, uh, I would take the same year, 2020. Um, I had to wind down a portion of my business because um, the, the pandemic was, uh, it hit my business like a tsunami. And I think for any business consultant, because mm -hmm. um, consulting is a discretionary expense, it was quite impactful. And I literally um, had to make a decision to wind down an entire segment of my business. Um, which was challenging for me, uh, you know, you always say, well, I'm not gonna give up on myself. I'm not gonna give up on myself. But mm -hmm. 
sometimes you have to make the right decision, a smart decision. Decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was a lot. It was a loss, but um, it was something that I last year spent a lot of the year trying to climb back from. Um, and that's how I look at it. I don't, I don't look at any loss as permanent, right? right? Mm -hmm. It puts you in a different place and you have to navigate your way back to wherever it is you want to be. Um, and that's, that's what I, that's what I did. That's what I do. That's what I did. That's what I'm working on. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And um, if someone uh, that's listening wanted to, is interested in um, investing and learning some of the things that they need to do, or someone is an entrepreneur and, and they're looking for angel investors or somebody like you for guidance or to lead them in, to just help them to set up, um, how can people get in contact with you? How can they reach you? Sure. Um, my email address is labone at chisaraventures.com. It's L-E-B as in boy, O-N as in Nancy, E at C-H-I-S as in Sam, A-R-A-V-E-N-T-U-R-E-S as in Sam.com. Mm -hmm. um, you can also go to chisaraventures.com, which is my website. Um, and you can... Um, you know, set up an appointment there. I do free um, brief consultations. Uh, so you can sign up for one of those or you can sign up for a full appointment. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a program that um, I uh, founded and I'm running called Acquire 1898. Um, and um, for your benefit, uh, it is a um, program designed to teach and equip black and brown entrepreneurs with the information and resources needed to acquire profitable businesses. Can you say the name of that company again? Acquire 1898. 1898. Yes. And um, we're basically, the program is um, being built out right now, but mm -hmm. the, the goal is to, um, to teach black and brown entrepreneurs um, and equip black and brown entrepreneurs to acquire profitable businesses. Excellent. Um, 1898 is the um, year of Black Wall Street in Durham. I Let's was about to black ask Wall you what's the significance of that 1898, and there it is. <laughs> Everything you do has significance, and I, I just want to say um, I'm so proud of you and to see what you are doing um, you do a lot, not only for business, but you are very involved in community work. You're on a number of different boards. And I don't know where you get the time, but I just want to say um, thank you for all the work that you're doing. So what, what's next for La Bone? Not sure. Uh, um, I'll be running my business. Um, I enjoy what I do. I'm hoping that um, 2021 was actually a great year for rebuilding. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping that 2022 continues that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking to do some international travel, um, looking to complete the build of Acquire 1898. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, that's it for now. <laughs> Excellent. So before you go, is there anything that you haven't said that you would like to say um, to, you know, educate or, you know, share something that you think um, the audience might learn from, especially with um, growing and, and creating financial wealth? I think beyond yourself mm -hmm. is probably the only thing I'd leave you with is um, we really as a people need to think beyond ourselves. And I think when we begin to do that, all of the rest begins to flow. Um, you know, I don't have any children right now, mm -hmm. right? But I have a trust that I've created, a life insurance policy that I've created. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have an entire estate that I've built out 
because whether I, if I bear children, great, they can have it. But if I don't, I have a nephew, I have goddaughters, I have family. There are generations after me that need wealth passed on to them. And what we conquer, they won't have to kill, right? right? If we can't conquer it, they're going to be at war with it. So how much, you know, how much can you do to move the needle for the next generation, right? That's really what, if we, if we can ask ourselves that, and you'll see that as you move that needle, you're benefiting. Mm-hmm. You benefit from moving the needle. Yeah. They'll benefit more, but you'll feel the benefit of moving the needle for them. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much, Labone, um, business strategist, coach, angel investor, and entrepreneur. I wish you nothing but success in 2022 and continue to do what you do to impact brown and black people. Thank you so much for your time. It was such a pleasure to have you on today. Thank you. This was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. (laughs) 